All right, how are you guys doing? Woo! Woo <laughs> how do you find the conference so far? Great. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. This is our second, our, your first time here, both of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. How do you feel about the crowd? Do we like the crowd? Yeah, yeah I like the I crowd. Guess, yeah. Important crowd. first question. This, this could go really wrong for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. The crowd's just okay. <laughs> <laughs> Alex is okay, though. It's like loads yeah. of questions oh, yeah. paying attention. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much for the questions. Do you have any questions yet? <laughs> <laughs> he has them in his bag. Oh, shh. <laughs> All right. So, like, um, yep. <laughs> Can you guys oh, all share yeah. with me? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it's open to the floor. All right. So, uh, we're going to start by getting some questions from the floor. Okay. So, we also ran like a few like uh, surveys on Facebook. We've got some questions from people that we know that we wanted to ask, but we're going to start from a few questions on the floor. And then. Uh, please uh, just state your name and who the question is pointed to. It could be for both. And what is your question? Go ahead, anybody. If not, we'll start with the Facebook questions. Your only chance. Faris has a question at the end. Uh, yep. Uh, this is to both of you. So what attracted me to Ruby was that it was optimized for developer happiness, which I thought was pretty cool. But I find most, quite a lot of other programmers, they don't seem quite impressed by the developer happiness thing. They say it's like too magical, it's too complicated. So what are your opinions on that? Do programmers even want to be happy? <laughs> 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 Uh, this is a strictly Asian question. Like, <laughs> you can't have too much fun. Dad says no. <laughs> I like easy stuff. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I. Round of applause for the hardest question today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this is this is probably the face I would make if I met someone that said to me, "I like hard hard things." <laughs> I mean, I like easy I like easy programming languages. I think it's I think it's um, I don't know. I meet some programmers who are like, "Oh, I like it. I want maybe." I think maybe what you might be getting at is that some programmers won't take Ruby seriously because they think it's too easy, right? They'll say like, oh, well, this is, this is just an easy, easy scripting language and I can't do any seri like, serious business with it. Um, and I totally disagree with that. I think it's um, basically, if you're, if you're just thinking about the programming language that way, it's, um, it's just that you haven't scratch the surface yet. You're just looking at it and saying like, oh, that's simple. It must not be very powerful. When in fact, it's just, it's very easy. It is easy and you can do powerful things with it. So it's, it's both of those things. Um, so I don't understand why people would have that opinion. <laughs> does that answer the question? I think so. I think it does. Thank you. All right. So this one comes off from our Facebook survey, and it's about hiring. So what would be the, f the things that you look for in a Ruby programmer when you're hiring specific skill sets, skip uh, specific knowledge of the language, or the framework rails? Either one of you. I'll go first. Yep. Um, well, I hadn't thought about an answer yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. It depends. So it depends on the position that we're hiring for. Yep. So, I mean, yeah, it really depends on the position. If it, if we're hiring for a junior developer, just I don't know, basic programming experience doesn't have to be with Ruby or anything. Just any type of any type of programming language, as long as they know like basic OO skills. Um, 
and of course like having any experience with Rails is helpful, especially at, so at GitHub, um, most of our code is in Ruby and it's a really big Rails application, so experience with Rails is helpful in our case. Um, but we have a lot of teams that just do Ruby stuff not related to Rails as well. So uh, as you go into senior engineering, then maybe more experience with Ruby and hopefully other languages as well. Maybe like, I don't know, we have a lot of different languages, C++, C, Rust, different things like that. But it just depends on the level. Well, I would take a person who who can enjoy the change, who, who enjoy learning new things, because Ruby and Rails is always changing and always getting better. So I'll take a person who, who wants to learn new, new things over um, rather than uh, someone who memorizes all Rails API, because Rails API will change uh, on the next day or next week. <laughs> All right, so we have another question from the crowd, please. Raja Hafaifi. Uh, hello, guys. So um, I think we know that Ruby is very good with uh, the web community. So I mean, 12 years ago, probably we can say PHP is the leading. Now we are the leaders. They are copying us. But in terms of like data processing, like Python is like way beyond us. Like all this, I mean, like for some reason, I, mean, I think it's very similar language. But Python is way ahead of us. Uh, what need to change like in our community or in Ruby itself so that we can be competitive in in data processing or big data and stuff like that? Can you guys tell us? As we just learned today, it's not a very similar language at all. <laughs> well, as far as I know, there are some people working on the some libraries for that on Ruby, but it's not yet matured. But you know, Ruby was designed for general purpose language at first, but DHH made it a, really a web language. So I think there's no other no uh, real job other than web right now. Good, but. So to name some, um, there's a library called PyCall, which is developed by Murata-san, M-R-K-N. And you should check it. It should work. And <laughs> um, there's a, what was that? CyRuby project? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's it's. Maybe not production ready yet, but some people are hardly working on it, I think. Uh, I think there's a lot of libraries. So we have a lot of libraries similar to stuff that's available in Python. Uh, so we have, we have some data scientists at work, and they use Python. And I asked them, why don't you use Ruby? And they just said, well, we don't know Ruby. <laughs> And so I think, I personally think part of the problem is um, advertisement. Like, we need to somehow advertise to data scientists, like, hey, Ruby is, you can use it. We have, we have tools for doing this stuff. You can do it in Ruby as well. Uh, I, think, I think the scientific utilities in Python have already been made popular, so everybody knows about them, and there's books about them, and stuff like that. So. I think what we need is more, more advertisement. We need a we need a rails of the scientific world, something like that. <laughs> uh, Ruby's been around a long time now. How has the and Akira yesterday you said it's no longer Matt's doing the work, uh, but we still know it as Matt's language. How how is the work effort coordinated around the core team and how has that changed? And also how do you feel it compares to some of these newer languages like Rust that have a really um, clear public process for new features like the RFC process? Go? I'll, I'll, 
I'll answer. I'll go first. Um, <sighs> let me think about this. So, so, so Matt's is the language designer, and I think I think Ruby. So Ruby started out as a group of. I think hmm, the Ruby group is more anarchy. I would say. <laughs> Um, so it started out with just a bunch of hackers sending in patches and Matt's is basically like, uh, yeah, no, whatever, right? He's the, he's the BDFL of the project and that's essentially how we, how we run it these days is like anybody can send in, anybody can send in patches and propose features and things like that. Um, but, uh, Matt's is the ultimate yes or no on it and I think he wants to keep that, keep basically keep that process like he likes that he likes that process of essentially just an anarchistic group essentially um, but if you have an idea so I'll give you the pro tips like if you have an idea that you want to get into Ruby um, I'll give you some extremely good pro tips for actually accomplishing that one is to write a patch that implements it and I would say that 99% of the time even if I like even if I wrote the patch Matt's will ignore it. Um, <laughs> he will have no idea about it. Uh, what you have to do is pay attention to the mailing list and you'll see every once in a while, I think maybe, I don't know, every month or two, there is a developers meeting in Tokyo and basically uh, Matt's is on, the, on Skype or whatever, or sometimes in person with a bunch of other core team members and they just go through everything in that agenda and force Matt's to answer yes or no. <laughs> so what you do is you propose your feature, it'll probably get ignored, then you put it into that into the developer meeting notes. Anybody can anybody can add stuff to that agenda. So you add to that agenda and then you'll get an answer. <laughs> so that is the pro tip for you. <laughs> yeah, Aaron answered it very well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer, I think. So, um, yes, we ha we we introduced that system since last year or like two years ago. We do have the developer meeting monthly in Tokyo, um, and we go through the issues on Redmine. So, um, I would like to say, I would advise. Um, don't give up if your proposal was ignored because um, the Matt's answer will change according to him, his, I don't know, something like moods or something. <laughs> <laughs> so even if we, your proposal was once rejected, just copy it and paste and create another new issue, <laughs> then it will eventually accept it someday. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Uh, this is a question from uh, the survey we had on our Facebook group. Uh, people are wondering, uh, how's your typical day like dealing with uh, Ruby issues? Oh. <laughs> Ruby issues. Yeah, like, are you looking at them every day? Like, what, what do you do? What's your process like? And what do you ignore? What do you try to look at? So for Japanese or for those who can read Japanese, there's a blog <laughs> written by uh, Ruby Core Nagachika. And he writes the blog every day. And he wrote, writes about every single Ruby commit. <laughs> he describes all commits. So. I read that daily. <laughs> and, um, and uh I I build Ruby almost every day, Ruby trunk and I I I use that Ruby two five trunk for my daily use so that I can find bugs quickly. Um Is there any specific things that you Oh, we're looking at recently? 
not really nothing at the moment. <laughs> it's just here and there, bugs here and there, or mm -hmm. issues mm -hmm. here and there. Mm -hmm. I, I try using Ruby trunk on Rails ah. to find bugs. Th that's what I do. We so I do the same thing except reading Nagachika's blog. I didn't know I didn't know that he wrote that. Every single commit. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Even SVN attributes. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I use I use Ruby 2.5. I pr build it pretty much every day, and we've we've also deployed it to production at GitHub. Uh, we I think we rolled it we rolled it back because we only had we only had one server running it, and all of the other servers were Ruby 2.4 something, and we just didn't want to have an inconsistent inconsistent production server. So we were running that in production to test it. Um, lately, I've been looking at, um, we had a patch, Aman submitted a patch quite a while ago, and it was ignored and then rejected. <laughs> and I am copying and pasting that one in because we need a feature, and it's, what it is is uh, we want to introduce um, uh, hooks around fork, so like before fork or after fork. Um, have that in the lang as a first class thing in in the language itself because we need that for oh unicorn and stuff different forking different forking things but um, as far as bugs are concerned usually usually um, I only look at when I'm reading through Redmine I only look at ones that um, are around things that we do at work or around libraries that I maintain. So stuff you know, like YAML parsing or whatever. Sometimes I look at OpenSSL ones, but those are the ones those are the only ones I look at are just stuff that I'm stuff that I'm familiar with. Um, or if we run into bugs at work, then I usually dig into those ones. All right, that's a cool one. All right, this is the most asked question. What are your plans to keep Ruby competitive with other languages? Hmm. It doesn't have to be personal plans. You know. Attend every conference in the world. <laughs> <laughs> You're almost there. <laughs> hmm. Well, so my particular plans are to continue advertising for Ruby because I love Ruby, Ruby programming language and I want people to use it and I'm so happy that I have a job using Ruby so I want to advertise it to everyone and tell people how great it is. Uh, but also I want to help, I want, I'm trying to help develop Ruby itself so working on, working on the language itself I'm going to be presenting about GC stuff so trying to improve trying to improve those particular things so we can keep pushing the language forward I'm hoping that um, Vlad's work will be fruitful uh, Vlad if you don't know about him he's a Russian super hacker that wrote a uh, a JIT for a JIT for Ruby and it's really impressive so I'm I'm hoping that that'll go forward unfortunately I don't think I'm smart enough to work on that. <laughs> so I hope that I hope that he finishes it. <laughs> so I guess my plans are to be Ruby's biggest cheerleader. <laughs> we we also hope other Vlad's work was gonna be fruitful. <laughs> yeah. Plus one for that. Akira, what about you? So besides writing code, um, as I talked yesterday, I'm running a conference and a user group in Tokyo. And what I do there is um, basically connecting people. So um, um, my biggest concern is connecting Ruby and Rails, for example. and. Um, um, actually, I, we have a, a weekly Ruby Tuesday meetup in Tokyo, and um, we have so many guests from overseas, like like Aaron, some so several times, yeah. yes, <laughs> mm -hmm. visited us, and um, 
you know, that's for fun, uh, for example. Uh, basically, we have so many Ruby core members in our meetup, so you can meet some more Ruby core members when you visit Japan and visit our meetup. So please come to Tokyo and <laughs> say hi to me. <laughs> sure thing. Uh, we have a friend in Tokyo. I wanted to, I wanted to say I think I think one of Ruby's strengths compared to other programming languages isn't necessarily the language but it's the community surrounding the language as uh Kira was talking about in his keynote yesterday and I think that so it's important to me to strengthen that like um try to help educate people and bring more it's important to me to bring more people into the community so uh that's why I want to be Ruby's biggest cheerleader. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, if you guys don't know about the history, actually, for the KL Ruby uh, meetup, is that uh, like a few years ago, I went and a few pe people here as well uh, went to Red Dot, and we heard about this awesome meetup, month uh, weekly Ruby Tuesday meetup in. Japan, asakusa.rb, and it inspired us to start up uh, the KL chapter of the Ruby Meetup, and four or five years later, here we are. So thank you very much, Akira-san, for, for inspiring all of us. <laughs> and to be honest, asakusa.rb was started because uh, we, we copied Seattle RB style. <laughs> Saksari was started in 2008, and Seattle Ruby was started in back in 2001, I think. So we're this with the meta 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 meta. Yeah, yeah. We, we got it. Yeah. One more question from the crowd. Nick, please. So Ruby two is awesome, and I love it. I feel the same way about you, but I don't know how much. Uh, but how do you avoid what? practice is that um, to avoid Perl 6, um, we decided to release Ruby every year since 2.0. So uh, we're going to release 2.5 this year, 2.6 next year, 2.7 next next year. And maybe um, we're going to release 3.0 after 2.7. So it's going to come within three or four years. Okay. Uh, the, the other thing is that Matt's is very, well, I think the whole core team is uh, uh, very sensitive to backwards incompatibility. So we make sure, we try to make sure that every, every release of Ruby is very backwards compatible with previous code, or if it's not backwards compatible, that the um, uh, uh, cost benefit is there. So like, if you have to change your code, then there has to be a really, really good reason to change, change your code. Like, you can keep it. Yes, if you like your source code, yes, if you like your source code, you can keep it. <laughs> But it's like you have to have if it's going to be incompatible There has to be like some really really good benefit or s some reason for you to upgrade like for example going from 1.8 to 1.9 uh, We got in we had encodings and of course that broke everybody's code But on the other hand we also got an amazingly fast virtual machine. So you're like well Oh, I don't want to upgrade, but on the other hand, my program will be way faster <laughs> So I'll just do it and upgrade there has to be some Yeah, yeah. So, so it's important that it's backwards compatible, and if it's not backwards compatible, there has to be a good, good reason why. So that's how we avoid Python three. <laughs> or Trump care. Or, or Trump care, as they call it. <laughs> All right. 
We have one more question. Oh, we have a few more questions. What is the craziest thing you've seen at a Ruby meetup? Yeah, like a meetup or a conference. What, what an odd question, guys. A lot of you voted for it. <laughs> I would like to introduce Mame's works. Oh. Um, can I actually? Yep. Yes, we you can. Google something? Yep. <laughs> Uh, github.com slash mame. Yes, this guy. So this person became a full-time Ruby committer since last month, I think. He's hired by Cookpad, and he's now working full-time on Ruby core. Um, he made some amazing products. One is that opt carrot. That's a NES emulator with memory. Can you get it scroll down a little bit? The project is aims to provide an enjoyable benchmark for Ruby <laughs> implementation. <laughs> it's a NES emulator um, written in full pure Ruby and Yes, it, it's a Ruby benchmark, actually. It's like this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, let me go quick. So another product is, can you go back? And uh, Quine Relay, that one. This is a Ruby script that outputs Scala script that prints these 100 languages <laughs> and goes back to Ruby finally. The script looks like, uh, uh, can you see the code? These are basically how, how to install 100 languages. <laughs> what? What? So can you scroll up? And there's a, uh, can you see the lib, lib directory? No, actually, example or something. Uh, Venzer, maybe. Venzer, qr.rb. No, not in Venzer, sorry. Uh, it's on the top source? No, there, at the top, top level, sorry. qr.rb. So this is how the, program look, looks like. <laughs> yes. yes, it's a Ruby code, ex executable. <laughs> and this prints out a Scala script exactly look, looks like this. <laughs> For 100 languages. <laughs> And finally, goes back to Ruby, <laughs> exactly the same code. How much time does he have? <laughs> <laughs> so this is the craziest thing I've ever seen in Ruby. This is the craziest thing for sure, but I think this is too wholesome for the question. I think people were looking for like a scandalous answer. <laughs> scandalous answer. <laughs> <laughs> Poor choice of words. <clears throat> I'm trying to think. I, I can't think of anything. I mean, this is, I'm a huge fan of Mame and, and his code. This is the, the craziest thing I've ever yep. seen. All right, we'll take it. We have actually demoed a couple of his code uh, from, uh, um, what's that, Trick? Yeah, so we have actually, I have actually demoed Trick 2015 uh, uh, and at 2016 and both of his entry is also like super mind blowing. <laughs> my well, my other my other favorite thing is something that I wrote though. I'm, I don't want to <laughs> <laughs> shameless plug, but we'll take it. All right, let's go, well let's go go to GitHub.com/tenderlove/phuby. <laughs> yes. P H P H H U B Y. Fubi. 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 Let's see what Fubi is about. Uh, uh. 
So this, this embeds PHP inside of Ruby, so you can execute, scroll down a little bit, I think I have an example. Yeah, so you can, you can execute, uh, you can execute um, PHP inside of your Ruby, and you can actually access the, access the code, whatever you ran from PHP, so you can get that out. And then, and then I, it might not say it in here, but I made it so that you could write your views in Rails in PHP. So you could write your controller in Ruby, <laughs> and, 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 then, and then your view in PHP, and then you could, you could use that. <laughs> in my Ryan Reynolds meme, but why? Why? Yeah. Why not? <laughs> The best answer to why. Ever. I mean, I mean, why, why, why do a hundred language client? <laughs> <laughs> when he can do it, because <laughs> he can. <laughs> All right, another question for the crowd, please. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey. <laughs> Senior question asker. <laughs> um, I have a question. Uh, when you start the. Like learning Ruby, you hear stuff like Ruby is object-oriented uh, language. Then you see a lot of functional stuff in Ruby, like closures, like uh, Python closures around, like metaprogramming and other things. Then you read further and you say, and you read that Ruby is uh, not a static language, uh, not a static type language. And now we have considering adding types to the Ruby language. Why we shift in paradigm, or is it was a plan uh, at the beginning, and why are we doing that? Wait. So the question is, why are we adding types? Yeah. Why are we adding types? Why are we saying that it's object oriented, but we still have like functional stuff in it? Uh, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> so why why is it why is it object oriented and we have functional stuff? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I guess it was just Matz was influenced by Lisp and other functional languages as well as um, oh what was the other one? Help me out here. Smalltalk. Smalltalk. Yeah. Thank you. So very OO with FP stuff. I think that's why we have both of them. Um, as far as types are concerned, I don't think we're adding types. Well, I mean, Matt's talked about type inference, um, but I don't think he likes putting types, like putting types into the code itself, and I agree with that. Uh, I like the idea of doing type inference. The kind of thing he was talking about is saying like, okay, well, we can, let's analyze the code and uh, so for example, you have some function, the function takes a parameter and you call a bunch of different methods on that parameter, right? So we should be able to infer that whatever that thing is that you pass into that function, it needs to, its type is that it needs to respond to those particular methods. So we can calculate the types based on that. But I don't know that we're ever going to have something that's like put a type into, like, you know, types, this has to be a string. Um, I think the reason, the reason is because that might ruin duct typing. So for example, like, um, oh, uh, string IO, string IO doesn't actually inherit from IO. So if you say, but you can use a string IO rather than an IO, so if you said this parameter has to be an IO, well, now you can't use a string IO there anymore. So um, rather than saying it has to be an IO, we, ha we, need to be, we need some way to say, oh, it needs to respond to write or close or puts or whatever. So I, I hope that, is that kind of? Yeah, yeah, kind okay. of. Yes, uh, I personally kind of like working on, uh, I mean, writing uh, optionally typed language, like, like Swift or like, like maybe Scala, but Matt hates it, so <laughs> that will never come to Ruby, I think. And um, we're still discussing about the types, so there's no, no concrete answer at the moment, but this uh, Mame is work started working on types in for Ruby three full time. So we'll see 
his implementation maybe next year or we so at at github we have a private fork of ruby that adds types to it uh so you can actually put a type you can say like oh this parameter is string and you actually type string into that and then we do some type checking some type checking based off of that some static code analysis based off those particular types i think we're going to the plan is that we'll open source that um i'm not sure when i'm not sure when we'll open source it um i think they want to have like marketing or something around it <laughs> i don't know uh but to be honest i'm not actually a fan of that and it's basically because of because of the duck typing duck typing stuff it ruins our our particular fork actually puts the types in so it has to be like string blah and it does ruin the duck typing so um i'm not a huge fan but other people at work are so we're doing it <laughs> is that something like mira uh yeah it's similar to mira yep thank you uh Oh, this. Sorry, one more. Hello. Um, I know there are many learning resources in English for Ruby, uh, but am I right to say that uh, to contribute to Ruby, you have to speak Japanese? And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, no, that's not true. It's I think pretty much. It's true that a large percentage of the core team are Japanese, um but you don't need to speak you don't need to speak Japanese to contribute at all. Um We have a lot I think um so there's two mailing lists, there's an English English language mailing list and a Japanese language mailing list and I'm on both of them. I speak Japanese, so I read both, but what happens is basically the conversation if the conversation ever starts on the japanese list and it's about a new feature or anything like that it'll just get transferred over to the english language list so any any decisions about the language itself are made on the english english mailing list um the only time i've ever seen stuff not go from the japanese mailing list to the english list is when it's something like a bug like someone just reports a bug and like okay we'll fix it and then it just gets fixed so i would say the I don't know. 99% of the communication is done in English. Thank you. Next question. Oh, okay. Uh, hi guys. My name is Anton and I want to ask you a really simple question. So, uh as I think most of us uh program to build some products, commercial ones, uh open source ones, uh educational ones, right? But only few of us actually works on uh language design and its implementation so could you as a uh, guys who really do that thing advise some entry point for anyone who wants to switch from building products to design language and implement that design thanks it's a, it's a question to both of you of course i think just before that like uh, can can you clarify like how much other work that you do in programming how much other commercial work that you do in on your in your free time or in just your time in general um i don't know right now i'm mostly doing commercial work though i hope to rectify that situation shortly um <laughs> Your question is I think your question is interesting though because um I would say even among the core team not many not many of the people on the core team are actually doing language work in particular like maybe only uh Koichi um yeah and, and Nobu Koichi and Nobu are the main ones working on the working on the virtual machine like I think most of the other most of the other core team developers can understand it understand it but aren't necessarily working on it on a day-to-day -day basis most well, of them yeah i i would rephrase my question then so to understand the concepts what is the you know most you know what is the best fit as a first step i mean it could be a book it could be a you know some source code base of some language interpreter or compiler or 
or any resource uh, on the internet. So just a top one, top two, top three, or you name it. What what works best for you? What worked best for you? I can't think of anything. I can't think of any books off the top of my head, but um, I would say that the Ruby's Ruby's virtual machine is highly based around uh, Java's virtual machine. So anything that you can learn about Java's VM or GC, anything, any of those resources should also apply to Ruby itself. Um, so if you don't need to think of, if you're trying to learn that stuff, don't confine yourself to only Ruby because it's generally applicable ideas. Yeah, it's a conceptual thing. Yes, yeah. But I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. <laughs> Google, how do virtual machines work? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll, give you, I'll give you some keywords. I'll tell you that Ruby's virtual machine is a stack-based virtual machine. So if you want to go, if you want to search for how VMs work, search for a stack-based virtual machine. Whereas actually the virtual machine that Vlad, part of uh, the stuff that he's proposing is, um, what is it, RTL? an RTL-based machine. So uh, if you want to learn about, there's two different types of VM stack-based and, and RTL-based. So Ruby's is stack-based, current Ruby's is stack-based, possibly will go to an RTL one, but if you want to search for resources, Google those terms. <laughs> okay, okay, thanks a lot. Um, there's a relatively new implementation of Ruby called MRuby which is smaller and um, easier and newer. So I think that's the good, uh, good resource to read. You can read everything, I think. OK, thank you. Cool, do I have one more question? Yep, Hafiz, behind you. I have actually two questions. Um, the first is, um, how would you compare the speed of how Ruby is developing in comparison to something like JavaScript? Um, also, uh, do you think it makes sense for somebody who's uh, got a Rails application going to switch to something like Elixir or continue in Rails? JavaScript and Elixir in the same question. Yes. Thanks. Man. Thank you. <laughs> First off, JavaScript is a terrible language. <laughs> <laughs> Let's clap for that, guys. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you can run anything you want to on the server, anything. Why would you choose JavaScript? It's so terrible. <laughs> OK, um, so speed of development, I think that's an interesting question, and one that, um, I mean, interesting and kind of unfortunate question because JavaScript has a lot of large corporate backers that we, we just don't have. Um, and I don't know, I mean, that, that definitely impacts it. Like Apple has a lot of money, Apple and Microsoft have a lot of money to throw at the problem and we don't. Uh, so that's, one thing that's not great, though we do have, I mean, we do have full-time full -time Ruby core team members, but still Microsoft, right? I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know if there's much more I can say about it than that. I do think, I do think that um, Vlad's work will be very helpful for us and his, his um, I don't know, I don't want to get too far into the weeds with that, but his proposal is essentially a very, very simple uh, JIT, JIT compiler, and the reason he designed it that way is not necessarily to be the fastest, but to be the easiest to maintain. And the reason behind that is because we don't have the money that, say, JavaScript does. Um, so I think that I think that our project is maybe faster than other languages, but not or speed of development is faster than other languages, but not necessarily as fast as JavaScript. Uh, and for switching. I hate that you asked this Elixir question because <laughs> I love Ruby, but Jose is also a friend of mine. <laughs> so I'm really conflicted to answer answer this question. <laughs> I would say I would say stick with Ruby, of course. <laughs> well, I love 
I love the situation that a Rails commander came up with an idea and created his new language. Um, we're not enemies, you know, we're friends. And I'd love to see that situation more. Actually, uh, Ruby is not Elixir, but Elixir is not Ruby, so we're different. And we're aiming a little bit uh, different goals, I think. And um, we're learning from Elixir. And um, actually, there are some good features in Elixir that Ruby does not have. And uh, we're thinking of importing, backporting kind of something from Elixir to Ruby. One is pattern matching, which is proposed several times to Ruby. And I guess we're going to have pattern matching in Ruby in the near future. I, I guess, I suppose. <laughs> so like that, uh, it's good. It's basically a good thing to have competitors because we can make each other better. All right, this is, next question is for Aaron specifically. Tough one. Why tender love? <laughs> <laughs> and how many times have you been asked? <laughs> Honestly, not like, not that many times. Maybe a few times. Well, okay, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell two stories. I want to tell two stories about this. First, I'll tell why. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It's an embarrassing story. It's basically, it's basically I was trolling my friend is how it started out. So I, I, at one point in my life, I had many, I mostly only had women friends. And we would hang out all the time. And I remember one night we were watching movies and, and we had started to have a discussion. One of my friends said, what is the... <laughs> what is the grossest thing a guy can say to you? And they were just going around, and one of my friends says, the grossest thing is I... <laughs> my username is Tenderlove. Yes, yeah, so, so, so along, these, along these lines, so I registered the website, <laughs> and I sent a link to my friend, of course it was just you know pictures of us hanging out, and she's like, I'm not clicking that link. <laughs> So basically, that was that was how it started. Was a troll on a troll on my friend, and just an inside joke between between our, us. Uh, and then, uh, of course, IRC. You have to shorten down the name, so I shortened down my name to that. That's just how my friends knew me, basically. So it stuck. Basically, it stuck with that. And I, so it's an inside joke among my friends that is unfortunately stuck. <laughs> I, I can't say that I really like the name that much. <laughs> so I, I, the other story I want to tell about this is I've never told my parents <laughs> this name. And uh, so my friends know me by this name, but my parents have no idea. And my, my parents are both engineers, and I tell them, like, I tell them what I do. They, I talk to my parents per, every week, and they know... It, they're both engineers, so it's not weird that I type at a computer to make my living, you know? And I tell them all about the stuff I do. Like, I tell them about, you know, programming, speaking at conferences, etc. And I thought to myself, well, well, this... I'm from Salt Lake City, and my parents still live there. And there was a conference happening there, Ruby Conference. And the organizer invited me and said, hey, would you, would you come give a talk? And I said, well... Yes, but only if you give me two tickets for my parents. Because I thought I would like them to come see what I do, you know. Uh, so I said, uh, the, the organizer was like, absolutely, we'll give you tickets for your parents. I'm like, okay, great. So I get into town, and the, we all go to the conference, and I meet the organizer, introduce him to my parents, and the organizer says, okay, I've reserved three seats for you down at the front, and it's an auditorium like this, and we come down to the front, and there's three seats in the front, and there's three signs on the seats, and the first sign says, tender love, the second sign says, tender mom, the third sign says, tender dad. <laughs> and, like, I've told them everything about what I do, but I, I have not, this is one thing that I've omitted, <laughs> I did not tell them this. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, no. 
<laughs> so I didn't tell, I didn't explain to them why. I just said, look, people know me by this name. Don't worry about it. <laughs> They're going to ask you, don't, just don't worry about it. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> so that's how they found out. And we have, we have not talked about it since then. <laughs> so it is an unfortunate name that has stuck with me. That is it. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for both being tender panelists today. Thank you, thank you so much. One more. Aaron and Akira, guys. Thank you so much. All right, so we are going to break for lunch, and we will be back here at 2 p.m. Sharp.